let's move on to the game that started it all, Halo. Combat Evolved. Yeah, that subtitle's kind of dumb. I know it's meant to indicate the remake of this particular game, but the combat itself has remained the same. All this remake is is an update in the visuals. The combat didn't quote unquote evolve until later installments in the franchise. Okay, enough ranting about that silly subtitle. Don't judge a book by its cover as they say. Halo, the military sci-fi shooter that revolutionized video game franchises. A game that Bungie themselves did not expect to be a smash hit, yet sold widely to critical acclaim. With its smooth gameplay, addictive multiplayer, and a narratively enriching campaign. Having played through this game myself, despite some dated element in this game, I can see why it was quite revolutionary back in the day. I can see why it stood tall with the likes of Half-Life. One of the elements that made Halo stand out, even from Half-Life, to a certain extent, was its presentation. One of the first things that the original players of the original game were treated to was an ambient overlook of the Halo device itself, with ethereal and simultaneously upbeat music playing in the background. This whole franchise emanates the sense of significance from the past combined with the wonders of modern-day technology, or, well, futuristic technology, if you know what I mean, and the amazing music by Martin O'Donnell indicates that elements of the past, present, and future could be in harmony, and all add to the epic tone of the franchise. Gregorian choir that adds a sense of awe and wonder, the drums that start to build you up for some action, and a rather interesting emphasis on strings over brass, the atmosphere of this game built a profound sense of mystery, which is the primary focus of this game. Which, in a way, is a great way to be introduced to this franchise, since despite the fact that there is a lot of lore going on behind the scenes, the premise is simple enough for anyone to get into. The heroic Master Chief, aided by the AI with a soul, Cortana, must confront the attacking alien Covenant and unlock the mysteries of this enormous ring-like device called Halo. In many respects, the players will be in a similar position of knowledge to the Master Chief, prepared for action yet still pondering what this Halo device could possibly be. And even though the Chief himself doesn't have much of an arc, the fulfillment of knowledge can in and of itself be an arc, as we find out what the Halo device is used for, which I'll get into later. This sense of mystery would have far less emphasis in later installments, yet this epic atmosphere that this game builds would definitely emanate throughout the rest of the franchise. So in that sense, Halo is a great introduction to bring people into the very basics on how this fictional universe works. But what exactly is going on here? Well, sit back and I'll tell you. After the events of Halo Reach, the human spaceship, the Pillar of Autumn, approaches a mysterious and absolutely ginormous ring-shaped device floating in outer space. Upon being attacked by the Alien Covenant, the humans awaken their greatest soldier from cryogenic sleep, the Master Chief. A protagonist as badass and almost as mysterious as the Halo Ring itself. He's like the distant cousin of Clint Eastwood and Steve Bloom, and also the Stig from Top Gear. Since the Master Chief has awakened from cryogenic slumber, the game has an admittedly clever excuse for a basic tutorial, which essentially serves the purpose of finding the player's suited play style of turn and aiming. Seriously though, who wants to play with inverted controls? And after that, the game wastes no time in getting you straight into the action. It even makes a bold move in not initially giving you a weapon to fight back, which gives you the same sense of panic that the other passengers on the Pillar of Autumn are feeling as they're being invaded. It gives the player a sense of urgency. And I like how the developers are not afraid of making you step away from the power fantasy a little bit. Just taking enough risks to make you realize how dire the situation is. Yet even when you do get a gun, some of these alien bad guys are very tough to take down. As they almost can take just as much bullet hits as you can. But nevertheless, the chief gets to the front deck and is greeted with Cortana 
the AI with a soul who's made such a big impact on gaming that Windows 10 has even named their own questioning thingy after her. As they flee the ship, they land on Halo. Initially, this was for the purpose of preventing Cortana from falling into the hands of the Alien Covenant, so as not to reveal the location of Earth. And as they explore this surreal device, they find something much bigger is at play here. The first level was all about engaging people into the action. The second level is all about immersing people into the atmosphere of the game. Landing on this ginormous halo, you find yourselves in environments that are eerily similar to planet Earth. Trees, mountains, rivers, grassy fields. It's usually quite mountainous in nature, yet as you look up, you're reminded that you're on a ginormous halo device. This is probably one of the most epic pieces of atmosphere in gaming. Just the mere act of looking up at the sky and seeing beyond the horizon and up above you, you're on a ginormous ring. And you just think to yourself, someone built this. This could not have just spontaneously come into existence on its own. Though much of that is established in the lore and we won't have time to go into that for now. It doesn't take long for you to encounter more alien enemies. But fortunately, you have human armies to serve at your side. Yeah, initially much of this level involves walking around, which can get somewhat tiring without the ability to sprint. But in this case it works because you're just so immersed into this surreal atmosphere that that initial movement mechanic doesn't really matter all too much. The gameplay is quite smooth enough as it is anyway. You help humans fight back against some aliens, and then afterwards... A pelican plane drops off a warthog car. The most recognizable vehicle in the franchise. With a human companion operating the turret. And somehow having demigod level strength to somehow just casually flip a warthog if it ever topples over. You're in for quite literally quite a ride. And the game continues you to immerse you in this regard. Even when some of the levels get annoyingly repetitive, which I'll complain about later, there's a grand sense of awe and mystery and grandiose scattered throughout the game. Some parts of the atmosphere almost feel quite spiritual at times, which is quite appropriate if you delve deep into the symbolism behind the characters and the scenarios of this series. Yet as you delve further into a game, there's a far greater threat lurking beneath Halo. This leads to one of the most horrific levels in a game that isn't initially designed to be a horror game. This is still a sci-fi military shooter with a lot of testosterone cliches, to the point of being downright cheesy at times. Yet this level, where a new enemy is introduced, does an excellent job not just with immersion, but also visual storytelling within the level itself, and building up tension with your companion Cortana busy at the main computer of Halo itself. You're left to investigate another area of the device. It's not unusual at this point to see little grunts running for their lives, like sugar and dosed numpties. But this time, it's not just the grunts that are running, but also the jackals with the shields, and even some of the elites, some of the toughest enemies in this game are fleeing for dear life from something more ominous. Alien bodies and blood scatter some hallways and other parts of this building that you're exploring. You delve deeper underground. You see a poor traumatized human soldier spontaneously shooting you with a pistol. Your armor can take the damage, but this man has mentally broken down. Blaspheming God's name obviously traumatized by some abomination he's encountered. You progress further. You see a helmet from a fallen companion. You play back the footage of what they saw. In shock of what they've encountered, Master Chief prepares himself for combat. And then you see them, overwhelming in numbers, out to eat and consume you. The infamous parasite known as the Flood. Gonna share the flood, gonna drown them out. I'm not gonna hear that line the same way again, and neither will you. Ha <laughs> ha! These parasites are the flood. Some of the most terrifying enemies in a non-horror themed game. The little squid-like forms are easy to take down, 
but they're so grotesque and there was so much build up to them, you can't help but feel somewhat terrified by them, especially in large numbers. Then you encounter the mutated forms that they take, if they take over the bodies of Covenant and humans alike. These guys are harder to take down, and some of them even get back up after taking several shots. And they can hurt and almost never cease to catch you off guard. Some of them could even shoot guns at you owned by their hosts. And it gets so ridiculous that this annoying robot named Guilty Spark has to intervene and insists that the Master Chief activate the Halo so that the flood can be wiped out. And yet, spoiler alert, as he approaches the computer with the key to activate Halo, Cortana intervenes and reveals that the Halo was designed as a weapon to wipe out all life so that the Flood would starve to death from lack of food. And Guilty Spark, yeah, he's called Guilty for a reason, almost succeeded in getting Master Chief to activate the Halos, just like that. Think about it, if the AI with a soul named Katana had not intervened, this franchise would have ended quite quickly. Thank God for Cortana. So what follows are a series of levels in which you take out more Covenant and Flood alike. And half of these levels are quite engaging, but half of them are annoyingly repetitive. From an interactive standpoint, some of the more engaging parts were recognizing that the Flood and the Covenant can be fighting each other and you could just stroll by, really hammering home the fact that the Flood doesn't take sides. Except for Halo 3, but I'll get to that later. And for as great as this game is, I actually consider this the weakest in the franchise. I know a lot of people praise this as one of the best Halo games, but I'm sorry, some of these levels are annoyingly repetitive. To the point where I even skipped several missions to get straight to the end. And the worst offender in this case is the level before the level where the Flood is introduced. I know a lot of people love to complain that the library was quite repetitive, yeah, that was repetitive as well, but for some reason it didn't really bother me as much as another level which I'll mention later. Because at least the library had some ounces of lore and wonder to keep your attention. And the Flood certainly knows how to keep you on your toes. The level before the Flood is introduced on the other hand? Uh... I will say this however, I love how some segments of this level have this snowy aesthetic in direct contrast to the sunny aesthetics and beaches similar to Normandy that we were exploring earlier. We will fight them on the beaches! But for the rest of the level, you're essentially going through the exact same types of limited halls and rooms over and over and over and over again! And again and again! To the creator's credit, there are these little arrows that tell you where to go in case you're lost. And if this is the way that Halo was meant to be built within the lore, fine. If the forerunners established in the lore built it this way for some purpose for the design, fine. But speaking from a gameplay standpoint, I got so irritated by these constant halls and rooms. This one particular type of room irritated me the most. It goes as follows. You're coming out the elevator. You enter into a straight hall. You find yourself in a round room. You have to fight several enemies. Left, right, and center. One way is kind of a dead end, so you have to go the other way. The enemies can overwhelm you, and you may just have to make a desperate leap to the door. You go up, left, right, exit. And in later parts of the level, you get this exact same process, rinse and repeat. This part frustrated me so much. When I got to this large open-ended snowy part, I didn't even realize I was near the end. I just skipped this level and by the time I came to a level that came to this exact same place again, I just thought to myself, nope, I've got no time to waste with this. So because of this, I haven't completed some levels of Halo Combat Evolved, I must admit. I'm sorry, I just didn't have the patience for that kind of repetitiveness. So, as you can tell, this game is embarrassingly dated in some aspects. However, 
this game does make up for it for a very exciting finale, which involves you tactfully blowing apart the generators of the ship before making a mad dash to an escape spaceship by driving a warthog vehicle, which began a constant trend throughout the Halo series of a final action scene referred to as the Warthog Run. These Warthog Runs are often the most exciting parts of the Halo franchise. And what's interesting is that unlike most games, Halo doesn't really end with a final boss encounter. It ends with a final spectacle chase scene, where you have to get to the end just before time runs out. Looking back now, that's kind of a narratively bold thing to do for video games. And certainly there have been some games that have copied this formula ever since, to an extent. This level was really exciting, where I didn't quite catch my breath until the last moments, where Master Chief and Cortana just barely make it to the last possible spaceship to escape before seeing the Halo Ring explode. Cortana says this is all over, but Master Chief rightly says that they're just getting started. So, I have a lot of respect for this game, but I'm sorry, I can't overlook some of the repetitive design that this game has to offer. I do appreciate extra le little features like switching back and forth between the old school and new school graphics. And, <laughs> a little side note, I don't know if it's just me, but firing the machine gun in the first Halo game made me feel like a monster with how loud and aggressive it felt. <laughs> But once again, this would only be the start of a grander narrative.